Hey guys, Seth here with another Raid Shadow Legends video. And in today's video, we are doing a community challenge video. So I asked my community to basically vote on six different champions that they wanted me to build a clan boss team around. I needed to change up my clan boss team to unlock Riho for the, the sort of new Shogun boss. So we wanted to just build a brand new team. And I gave them a couple of options. We had the options of Marinix. One of the fusions we had a while ago that actually has some pretty cool mechanics mechanics in terms of the A1 where you can get a lot of individual hits per hit. We also threw in a bit of a fun champion which was War Mother for people who wanted to see if bombs could work in uh, the arena. But what people voted for more than anything else is they wanted to see a team built around Roxam. Now Roxam is a champion that we thought would be really good but actually is very difficult to use. Now what's cool about Roxam is you get a decreased defense and a weaken on a single ability. Now the bad thing about Roxam is it uses Veil to do lots of different things. So if Roxam is under a Veil then this becomes an AoE attack which you know, you think that's pretty good. It decreases the A2's cooldown as well. If it's not under Veil, then it's a single target attack. Now, for a clan boss situation, we actually would prefer to have the single target because the multiplier changes. And the multiplier for the A2, uh, for this A3 on a single target is much higher. It's way higher. We're talking about a two times attack increase. But you can't really control it because you can see once uh, you attack without Veil, the Veil gets placed again. We also have a jungle ambush here which attacks one enemy, uh, fills this champion's term by 50%. There's a stun, there's also a sleep chance. Diff again, it's conditional based on perfect Veil or Veil being present. And again, you would get perfect Veil if you didn't have it. And we also have an A1 here, has a 50% chance of filling this champion's turn meter by 10%. Also has a 50% chance of placing Perfect Veil if it critically hits. So you can see, you can't really run this without actually having Veil on, but you also can't guarantee that you're going to have Veil. Also has a passive here that places Block, Debuff, Strengthen, and uh, a Continuous Heal uh, if they have a Perfect Veil. But if without that, it's just the first two for one turn, which is... Again, kind of nuts on an, uh, every single turn, you know, if you were to use it as a stun target. Now, the kit itself with the passive sounds really good, but you immediately would look at the A1 and go, that's going to be a Nightmare to Speed tune. The A2 would be a Nightmare to Speed tune. So I guess my community wanted to super challenge me here. Uh, but we have managed to make a team work. Although I will say I've had to reduce and remove some of the champion's abilities because really trying to support a 50% turn meter fill is incredibly hard in any speed tune. It's just a lot of turn meter to gain. So we've had to essentially turn off this ability. Now with these community challenges, I am not making these videos as a guide for you to basically reproduce this team. I will give you all the information you need to actually reproduce if you want to, but the builds you're about to see are extremely high-end builds. They require awakening. They require some of the best gear that I've got on my account. This is the, the stuff that I enjoy most about the game and I like the challenge of trying to push the highest damage possible. So this is a fun video. It's not a instructional video, but you, you know, if you want to do it yourself and see if you can push my numbers, go for it. What I will also be doing is more of these community challenges. I'm going to ask you to give me the challenge and I'm going to build teams around it. So if you watch to the end of the video, I will give you information about what the next poll will be. I'm going to do a poll on YouTube, on the community YouTube here, where you can vote for the next champion. We're going to combine that with the poll on my Discord, which you can join um, by the link in the description of this video. You can come join the Discord for this channel here specifically. I know Hell Hades has a main Discord. We have our own Discord for the live streams and stuff. And I will also combine it with a live stream poll that I will do when we get around to this next video. It'll probably be in about a week or two time. So with that being said, let's have a look at the champions we've decided to use. Now I'm a strong advocate that Demitha is probably the best unkillable option in clan boss right now. I mean, you've got infinity comps. I'm not really a big fan of them because I think they're so limited. You can't really do much with them. And to be honest, Mullet Reaver, Victor Tess, they're too big brain for me for like the that particular comp. They have got it down to the like the 0 0.001 accuracy. You know, fair play to them. Um, you also have man eater teams, but you're a bit restricted because you need so many champions to make the man eaters work. What's good about Demitha is you can make three one teams happen, and she can be a self sustaining sort of unkillable. So we are going to be running a Demitha style team, um, and we're also going to be using 
Jintoro, Seeker, and we're also going to be using Elva Autumnborn. Elva is basically like the Giga Charged Ares in most cases. It's kind of like a, a Myth Air, Mithru Elva kind of uh, Myth Watcher style team that we're running here. So a key tool that I use for all of these clan boss teams is of course the Dead Jedi clan boss simulator. You can see I have plugged in my champion speeds and my configurations here and these are the tune. This is the tune that I am running. It is a 3-1 Jintoro. It is a 3-1 Demitha. It is a 3-1 Elva. So we're going three turns to the clan bosses. One turn for those champions. Seeker is technically 3-1, but it's a guaranteed extra turn. So he's only actually attacking twice. And then we've put Roxam on a 2-1 because we kind of want to like reduce the speeds on him. The 3-1 speeds are quite high. Um, and we're pushing it. Now, the calculator does some funny things at the moment with Roxham. If you disable the A2, it seems to put the uh, the A3 on cooldown, which it shouldn't do when the A3 happens. Uh, it's actually quite difficult to simulate whether there's a veil and different things like that. That's stuff that needs to be updated in the calculator, which we will get to at some point. So I've kind of made an A4 here just to take away the effects of the A3 ability. Um, and what you can see, I also don't have my Roxam booked at the moment. So the A4 is going to get extended a bit too many times. Now, the, the good thing about this is we can actually support the Roxam's A1, whether it goes with turn meter or not. Now, the way you're going to have to check this is you need to make sure that Roxam doesn't jump ahead of anyone's turn and also beats the clan boss's breakpoints if it needs to at any point as well. So what do I mean by this? So when Roxam takes a turn here, she's going to reset the turn meter bar back to zero. So the next turn here we go and we get to 29. The clan boss calculator is always going to assume that you get that 10% turn meter. It's a 50% chance. So it's assuming you're always going to get it because the clan boss calculator cannot figure out the RNG. So it's going to give you it if you get it. So all we need to do is we need to go down the thing to the next turn for Roxam to make sure that Roxam is not exceeding or breaking any points with a 10 turn meter range. So what do I mean by this? So right now we're at uh, 29, which is fine because Elva is ready to take a turn. You can see it's very, or Jintoro, you can see it's very tight with Jintoro and Elva. We couldn't lose any speed on Jintoro. Elva then takes a turn because full turn meter bar. And then we should see here that the clan boss is at 93. Demitha is at 90. Well, Demitha is going to come in next because Demitha is running at 310 speed. So it's way faster than the clan boss. So Demitha is going to take a turn. Then Seeker is already ready next to take a turn. So Seeker is going to take a turn. So right now, it doesn't really matter whether we had plus 10 or minus 10 because the champions taking a turn would always be like much greater to meet about, right? Demitha is, you know, near double. Seeker is near like 40 plus more than the uh, than the Roxam. Now it gets more interesting. When we get to Jintoro here, we need to make sure that Jintoro gets a turn. So he needs to be 148, which is fine because if Roxam is at 123, it doesn't really matter. The clan boss can't take a turn because Jintoro has already overtaken it on that extra turn fill. And Seeker here is gonna overfill the Jintoro bar, right? When Seeker fills that, it goes to 122 because of course Jintoro has that passive where he increases the amount of turn meter filler effects he gains, which is why Jintoro tombs are always very difficult. Uh, Jintoro is then going to get a turn here at 144. So we need to make sure Elva makes a turn here. Now, this is where the first break point matters. We need Elva to go before Roxam. So if Roxam didn't get the turn meter fill, it's still fine because Elva, uh, Roxam is going to be at 142, which means Elva takes a turn. What we need to make sure is that Roxam has more than the clan boss on this turn. So we would be at 161 turn meter bar if we didn't get it. So if Roxam was a even a little bit slower, then this would not work. The calculator would show that it's working, but this would not work because if we didn't get that turn meter boost, we're at 161. If we were to drop it down a couple more speeds, say to something like this, we would be at 170, so it would be tie broken. So it would be too close. So that's why the, the speeds on Roxham are quite sensitive, but it can support whether or not you get that A1, which means affinity doesn't matter. If she weak hits all the time, it doesn't matter because no matter what happens, Roxham always has enough turn meter bar to breach that. And then of course, because Roxham's gonna go, Demith is gonna fill turn meter bar and overtake the clan boss to set up that unkillable setup. So just a little bit of advanced speed tune in there for you to how you can manage that A1. It's similar to how ninja problems happen, right? As long as ninja is going in order without that 10%, you can ignore the 10% bonus on the A1. Obviously, one thing I can't do is run counterattack. So we don't run any retaliation. We don't want run any revenge. There's no cycle of retribution, none of that nonsense. 
we cannot counterattack with Roxham because if Roxham counterattacks here, then potentially it could throw a spanner in the works if Roxham gains 10 turn meter here, right? Roxham would overtake Demitha here if the counterattack happened and Roxham got turn meter. So no counterattacks on Roxham. We disable the A2, we run A3 into A1, but because we got Jin Toro, we don't need the A3 debuffs. I've put a little bit of accuracy on her, but we don't need it because Jintoro will always do an A3 every single turn. So Jintoro is uh, our main sort of debuffer and we also put him on 3-1. Jintoro on a 3-1 is better than Jintoro on a 2-1, even in a weak build. Even if you have to lose 50% of your stats, Jintoro on a 3-1 is better because you get an A3 every single turn which means you get more chances at the five hit A3 and one five hit A3 is a lot of damage. When you watch the actual run, you'll see that it does around about 1.5 to 1.6 million damage. So even if you're running a little bit weaker build, it's just so much better to run three one. So I'd highly recommend if you use Jintoro, you try to push him into a three one team. We've then got Elva coming in and basically removing the stun. It doesn't matter. It's all fully immune. You can see that Jintoro has block debuffs and then Elva would cleanse it anyway. So it doesn't matter who can take the stun. You can have it go on any person you want. We are using, of course, her speed aura as well. Seeker is in here to provide the 2-1 boost that we need, the 3-1 boost. And then Demitha is just doing her usual things, which is extending on the A2 and then block damage on the A3. So that's the clan boss team. It pretty much runs straight away from A3. It can work as well on nightmare and brutal now the only fail scenario there is a fail rate scenario if roxam does not get turn meter on the first attack of turn two the team will fail so either you can just interact and basically run the uh, just hit it with an a2 just to make sure you get enough turn meter you can do a2 if you want just to guarantee you get that turn meter on this turn it's only this attack on turn two that it can fail otherwise it will run perfectly um, so I just tend to just run it on auto until I get to that turn two and just take it off auto, switch to the A2 and then run it full auto then from that point onwards just to make sure that it works. If it does get the turn meter fill, it works fine full auto. That's just the only thing you have to note um, on this team. So let's have a look at some champion builds. Uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this because these builds are very extreme. We're going to have a look first at the Demitha. Now, the good thing is I've got a lot of area bonuses, so I can take advantage of some bonus speeds. We're at 299 speed here, but we actually need to be at 311 speed. So I've upgraded my area bonuses to get myself some bonus stats. So we have Demitha here at 3.3k attack. 311 speed and 241% crit damage. Demitha only attacks once, but she can still produce a fair amount of damage. So don't ignore the damage that Demitha can do. It's, it's still quite high. We do have, in terms of a blessing, I've given her a commanding presence aura. So I'll get 7.5% more of my speed aura. I think that's just better for her generally. Um, we can get that up to 35% long term. You know, once we get a five star Demitha, then that really pays off in dividends. 35% more, 19% speed aura is quite a bit. Masteries wise, we have gone down what I would call a typical block damage setup. Warmaster down the left. We take Steadfast because in some teams you don't want Demitha taking a stun. If you have Steadfast, the clan boss doesn't like targeting Steadfast champions. And then we're just taking Laura Steel to help with the, the speeds or extra bonus attack from sets. Um, we don't really care about any defense tree because you're not taking damage in block damage, so you can't activate retribution. And to be honest, the stun will happen, but the average is about one times this will proc on a clan boss run. So it's a really low, low value uh, mastery here. So it's about 1.76 attacks per clan boss run based on the chance of this stun and everything else working because obviously there's only 16 stuns in the fight. So I, I don't recommend you go down the defense tree for block damage. Next up, we have got Elva Autumnborn, another fast champion. We've also got Elva in Toxic Set. I'm not running a Poisoner, so I can run a Toxic Set. I could probably run two Toxic Sets if I want to. We are running Toxic Set to add a bit of bonus damage. It's still very good and very viable. If you have Poisoners, you wouldn't run Toxic. This team doesn't have Poisoners, so we can run a Toxic. I prefer to have it on Elva because we're getting 
uh, two attacks every single clan boss turn and we're not diminishing the damage from other champions who are actually our damage dealers. You can see I've got a, a counter attack accessories on Elva to try and help with the toxic application. And of course we have gone down for the sniper have to have a 5% more chance to place it and the master hexer so we can try and extend those poisons. So it generally means she can get about four to five poisons out on an, on an average run once she gets going. We have Elva at, again, we're using our area bonuses, 3.2k attack, 314 speed, 183% crit damage, and then enough accuracy for, um, we don't really need the accuracy to be honest, I think we've just happened to have put her in an accuracy banner because it's fast. That's the only banner that I have right now. Ideally, I'd put her in an attack banner. She doesn't debuff and you don't need accuracy for the toxic set. So it just so happens that she has an accuracy banner. But I would be looking to replace that with an attack banner because more damage from attack. She does, again, it's a bit like the myth that she doesn't hit super hard, but her damage should not be ignored, especially when you start adding in toxic and the fact she is running brimstone. We do need accuracy for brimstone. That is the only thing to note. Obviously, that was a change. So maybe that's why I put accuracy. There's always a reason why I do these things. Masteries wise, you can see, as I said, we're taking the only difference between the is we're taking these for the toxic set. But again, it's a similar setup. So that is Elva Autumnborn. You can notice I've got some ascension, but I haven't upgraded it if it's been a poor roll. And to be honest, all of these were pretty bad rolls. Now we come to the more interesting champions. We have got Seeker, who is a six-star awakened Seeker. It's one of my strongest champions. We do have him in Cruelty. Now, if I was using Gnut, I wouldn't use Cruelty anymore because Gnut and Cruelty doesn't stack. I'm going to be covering that off in a video shortly. Um, but uh, So I would look to change this, but it's pretty good for a clan boss set, and you basically get 20% um, removal off the clan boss defense. And it's also damage in stats so he's getting 500 attack and 25 percent crit damage plus 10 speed so it's quite a big deal we've got him in cruel and crit damage sets and again similar mastery tree as you've seen we've gone down for the laura steel we'll get bonus attack and bonus crit damage from those artifact sets i have gone giant slayer with seeker now this is a more of a sort of a trying to push the limits giant slayer when it's a two attack a one basically kind of breaks even with Warmaster. The only difference is Warmaster will be consistent. It's 60%. It's more reliable. Whereas Giant Slayer will have peaks and lows. So you could actually have one run where you get a lot more Giant Slayer than another run where you don't get an awful lot of Giant Slayer. So I kind of tried to go for more peaks rather than just the consistency. You can get more damage on a two turn, a uh, two attack A1 with Giant Slayer, but it won't be as regular. So if you're close to a one key, you'd much prefer to go to Warmaster. I'm just exceeding the one key, so it doesn't really matter. In terms of a build, we have got this guy in 5.2K attack, 220 speed, and 331% crit damage. We don't really care about accuracy here, you know, all the other stats don't really matter. This is all pure. How much damage can I push? 5.2k attack, 331% crit damage. It is quite insane, but obviously he's six star awakened. But now we get to the real craziness. We are going to be using a one star Jintoro. Now we have another smite here to make sure that we always have Brimstone up. If I had a higher awakened smite, then I would be looking to maybe put him into Phantom Touch or something else because... We don't need both. You do lose damage with Brimstone because it's an accuracy blessing stat. You don't get crit damage. So it would make much more sense that we get a higher awakening Elva with Brimstone and move over to a Phantom Touch for Jintoro and get more crit damage and attack. That would actually make a lot more damage. But we have got Jintoro in a perception crit damage. As I mentioned, he's the one that's going to be applying this debuff, the decreased defense and weaken. And he does get 50% more turn meter, as I mentioned in the calculator. So he's actually quite tricky to speed to and he requires his own speed tune setup. Masteries wise, again, we are going down the similar tree. You've seen this tree over and over again. It's pretty much the same thing. But the build that he is in is crazy. This is probably the craziest build I've ever built. 5.7k attack, 309% crit damage. And you're probably thinking, oh, well, that's not that crazy. He's at 270 speed with accuracy for clan boss. 270 speed with 5.7k attack, 309% crit damage. And he's only a one star awakened plus zero empowered champion. I can go in, I can push this even harder. We haven't ascended any gear yet. We could probably get accuracy here and accuracy on here. 
and that will give us uh, basically enough accuracy that we can drop accuracy on the amulet and push more flat stat attack on the amulet and get more damage that way we can upgrade this to get ourselves plus 70 attack we could empower uh, ascend the, the these two items and get another 160 attack we can get more attack here we could get 20 percent crit damage here we could get you know you can you can see what i mean you can basically scale this incredibly hard to where i've got it right now but he is in a crazy crazy build and we saved the best to last the final champion here roxam now i was fortunate or unfortunate i should say to get a six star soul and in the end i just decided for the for the, for the pure sake of having a bit of fun and making content i awoke my roxam so we have a fully awoken six star roxam we did choose the phantom touch blessing Generally for clan boss, crush and rend is pointless because the defense is so low. You know, I've already got a cruelty. Aura is kind of a waste. It doesn't give you damage. Brimstone doesn't give you damage. So, you know, I, I basically chose to go for pure outright damage. The stats alone are insane. 750 attack and 38% crit damage and 15 speed is a lot of bonus stats. And we get this phantom touch proccing all the time as well. Currently, I haven't booked Roxham. I'm not sure if I want to really book Roxham. It's a it's a very heavy book investment for a champion I was doing for a community challenge. And obviously I don't get any sort of bonus perks or anything. Um, so a book is, it, I'm when I use books, it's like every other player who plays the game uses books, you know, so it's a difficult resource. We have gone the same setup again. We're going for the War Master. It's a single hit champion. And we've got it in a single crit damage sets. Generally, when it comes to clan boss, sets are less important than stats. The only set I would say is probably quite good, not so much for Roxham, is Retaliation. You don't really want anything like Savage or Lethal because you've already ignored so much of the boss's defense with decreased defense and cruelty and everything else like that. So you can just go for pure raw damage. Again, we haven't got much Ascension going on here. We got pretty unlucky with the rolls. Um, I haven't actually ascended the Amulet. We can give it a go here now, see if we get crit damage. We don't. That's just typical. You know, it's a one in one in four chance I'll get what I want there. So it's kind of disappointing, really. But there you go. Uh, but we can obviously scale this harder if we wanted to um, with a lot more stats. I was actually theory crafting this and it works out that Artifact Ascension now with the new accessories is actually giving you more offensive capability than Empowerment. Empowerment on Roxanne with a base of 1553 attack will give you somewhere in the region of around about 600 attack and 30% crit damage. Yes, you'll get like 10% crit damage and more speed and accuracy and things, but in terms of just like raw offensive capability, the actual Artifact Ascension will give you 1,000 attack and 32% crit damage. So it's 2% more crit damage and about 400 more attack just from the Artifact Ascension. So I don't really think empowerment is as strong as it used to be it's combined they're 100 strong I'm not diminishing the, the the value of empowerment it's just the artifact ascension is a game changer for actually boosting these builds so roxam currently right now is built at 7.7k attack 185 speed and 372 percent crit damage it's absolutely bonkers it's insane and remember what i mentioned about just a second ago I don't have all those bonus artifact ascensions. There's another 32% crit damage I could get. There's another 1,000 attack I could get on top of this. Then if we go for a plus four empowerment, like this is a world where you could get a 10,000 attack Roxum, 420% crit damage, um, if not if not four or if not higher Roxum build. It's absolutely mental how much you can scale champions. But 7.7k. 372 percent and then of course 185 speed and of course i haven't maxed out my area bonuses i haven't reached gold live arena yet because i just don't do gold arena i just don't do arena to be honest but i've still got some growth here you can see i can get more accuracy we can go up to another 12 percent more crit damage we can get more speed we can get another 20 percent attack like there is so much i can push even harder this isn't even like the highest possible build you can do it's actually quite insane so I'm just going to show you the AI setup and then I'm going to run the battle. I've been talking long enough. This is the community challenge that someone asked for. We are basically running this team down here. So we can make it pretty much full auto apart from that turn two where you have to make sure Roxanne gets on the start of turn two that 10% fill or interrupt and do an A2. We're going to open with um, the Elva A1. I, when, with these new champions, I tend to force the abilities because the AI doesn't always like to do things. We disable the Sprouting Season. We don't need it. It won't do it anyway, but I just like to disable it. And we force it to do the A2, and then it can just run as normal. 
Seeker, I open with the A1. We're delaying the A2 once, and then we just leave it as it is. One thing to note with Seeker, try not to run any sort of lasting gifts, because if you run it, then you can run into problems with a defense buff kind of throws out different things and it causes different problems in this team it's probably not as much of an issue because everyone is protected uh, but certainly i would be a bit cautious in non sort of not this team in other teams i've seen people fail because they're running lasting gifts on seeker and the defense buff is getting extended too long which means the myth is extending it another turn and then you've got defense buff where stun targets won't target the, the you know the champions with defense buff it can cause problems Demitha, we are running, um, opening with A1, then prioritizing A2, then A3. So this is a full auto setup. Jintoro, we are running with an A1 open, then forcing the A2 over the A3. This is to ensure that his A3 always runs when there is an increased attack. Normally with a 3-1 rotation, one of the three attacks doesn't have an increased attack. And you don't want your 5-hitter always going off on the ability where he doesn't have increased attack. It's why I'm not running him in things like refresh or reflex abilities, uh, artifact sets and accessory sets. Because I don't actually want him to RNG his A3 into a position where he doesn't have increased attack. I'd rather the consistency rather than the chance of just getting one bonus increased attack. Because if we actually lose a bunch of the A3s and it moves into that A2 window where... There is no increased attack. We actually lose so much damage, it's not worth it. So uh, this setup is to force it so that that A3 always runs on an increased attack turn. And then Roxham, we're turning off the A2 and we just open with the flicker step. So it's kind of insane. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to run the clan boss run for you. Uh, we'll probably speed it up and put some dramatic battle music. You can see the kind of numbers that are going off and you can see the scaling. The Jintoro damage is bonkers, and the non veil damage of that Roxum on the A3 is also a very hefty hit. So let's run that, and then we'll come back and we'll just close out the video.
So we've got 166 million damage. Now, this isn't my best key, which is actually a little bit disappointing considering how hard we actually uh, we actually built some of these champions. They're really, really high-end builds. So I think it's just a case of Roxam. If we had that consistency on that A3, we'd be getting those 400,000 hits more regularly. But because we kind of get perfect veil all the time it just doesn't work obviously we could book her that probably adds another five million damage based on just like raw damage books plus the cooldown rotationals so that could add more damage but still 166 million damage Jin Toro is a monster so that is community challenge complete now for our next community challenge we're going to have a theme this time and we're going to be talking about the banner lords so you're going to have a choice between four champions in the banner lords that i will build a clan boss team around based on what you vote for so the options you have available this time is going to be two legendaries and two epic champions i will pick one of them the winner of this poll is the champion that gets into the team so the first option you've got is killian the lucky Good old Cloverleaf Killian had a bit of a rework recently. So he is an option available to you if you want me to build a team around Killian. We're also going to be using option two, which is Richtoff the Bold. You can choose Richtoff if you want me to see uh, him kind of poison his way to all majesty and might. The third option available to you is going to be Sir Artemage. I am actually quite a big fan of this champion. So this could be an interesting epic if you want me to see it used in a clan boss. And finally, the last champion. The final champion that you can choose from is going to be Rowan. Rowan had a bit of a rebuild, like, I don't know, like six months ago. So I thought I'd throw this in as an option for you to vote. And I will build the clan boss team around whichever champion you vote for. So to vote for this, head over to the community tab of this channel. I will put a poll up when this video goes live and you can vote for the champion that you want me to build a team around. This will be combined with the Discord poll and combined with the live stream poll, which I will put on this channel when we actually go to do the poll for that. And we will build a clan boss team specific to that champion. There you go, guys. Roxam built into a clan boss team we kind of removed some of the, the 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 champions unique features and aspects but it works and we did a comfortable very comfortable one key on all affinities on all difficulties big thank you to my community for taking part in this it's a bit of fun for me it kind of changes up the content cycle where i actually have a bit of a you know the choice taken away from me and i'm forced into different things we'll see what we come up with on the next one but until the next video guys thanks for watching and i'll catch you in that video